Hello and welcome to Critical Thinking Revealed. I'm Linda Elder and I'm coming to you from the Foundation for Critical Thinking, a 501c3 prof nonprofit organization in California. The Foundation for Critical Thinking and its sister institution, the Center for Critical Thinking, were originally established at Sonoma State University by the late Dr. Richard Paul. We have been advancing fair-minded critical societies for 44 years. Ours is the longest running organization on critical thinking in the world. Our outreach includes educational institutions, business, government, and anyone focused on enhancing personal life or any part of life. Our framework details a rich, integrated, explicit concept of critical thinking based in ordinary languages, the ones that we speak every day, and is therefore accessible to the vast majority of people. We invite you to learn more about what we do at criticalthinking.org and to join our subscription community, the Center for Critical Thinking Community Online at criticalthinkingcommunity.org where you'll find the world's largest online library on critical thinking and an academy of self-paced learning activities, webinars, study groups, and more. These are for you, your colleagues, your students, your friends, employees, and everyone else. If we're to realize critical societies, we're not going to be able to do this by taking a superficial approach. And so we, we work at the Foundation and Center for Critical Thinking to advance a deep approach. And again, one that's accessible to everyone. In this series, entitled again, Critical Thinking Revealed, we are more generally attempting to better understand and act upon the best reasoning of those who are doing the best reasoning within their fields or specialty areas of specialty. We are especially focusing on the critical thinking moves they're making or conceptualizations that they are engaging in. And we want to help make things explicit in this program. This particular series is focused on the climate crisis and how we can best and better sustain the earth's precious resources and improve upon what we're doing in that arena. And we all know that there's much that we need to do. So in this regard, we invite experts to help illuminate the problems implicit in the climate crisis and to help illuminate recommendations for all of us moving forward. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce our guest for today's program, Dr. John Cook. Dr. Cook, thank you for joining us in this program. Hi, Linda. Uh, it's great to talk to you. John Cook is Senior Research Fellow at the Melbourne Center for Behavior, Behavior Change at the University of Melbourne. He is also affiliated with the Center for Climate Change Communication as adjunct faculty. In 2007, he founded Skeptical Science, a website which won the 2011 Australian Museum Eureka Prize for the Advancement of Climate Change Knowledge, and 2016 Friend of the Planet Award from the National Center for Science Education. Dr. Cook co-authored the college textbooks Climate Change Examining the Facts with Weber State University Professor Daniel Bedford. He also co-authored the textbook Climate Change Science, a Modern Synthesis, and the book Climate Change Denial, Heads in the Sand. And so we're going to get into uh, some of the ideas that you detail in these books. Uh, let me also add that Dr. Cook holds a PhD in cognitive science from the University of Western Australia. So before we get into the books and the specifics that you detail there, let me begin with this question uh, for you, Dr. Cook. What has been your primary purpose or set of purposes 
throughout your work focused on climate crisis or sustainability? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so really my goal has been countering climate misinformation or reducing the influence of misinformation about mm -hmm. climate change mm -hmm. and tackling that through the lens of cognitive psychology. So as mm -hmm. as you as you just said, like my discipline is cognitive science, cognitive psychology. And so my PhD that, that I did at UWA was really about what are interventions, what are messages or techniques that we can use to try to reduce the influence of misinformation and doing psychology research to test different approaches. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you, so, so what, what has your research revealed? What I found in my, um, during my PhD was um, basically I stumbled upon a, a, an approach called or, or a, a, a branch of psychological research called inoculation theory. Uh, and <laughs> like a lot of PhD students, I, um, I thought that I discovered it and then only found out after I had come up with this approach that scientists had been working on this since the 1950s. But um, what what I did designed in my experiments were messages where you try to um, pre warn people of attempts to mislead them. Here are techniques of misinformation that you might encounter that are designed to mislead. And the mm -hmm. the goal was by making people aware of mis misinformation techniques, it will. Um, it will build up their resilience, it will strengthen their critical thinking, and it will make them less vulnerable to being misled. When I then started presenting my research results at conferences, um, like professors would say, well, that sounds a lot like inoculation. And uh, I started digging into the literature and found that inoculation theory was basically that idea. You expose people to a weakened version of misinformation. And just like when we get vaccinated and we're exposed to a weakened version of a of a virus or a disease that builds up our immunity in the same way you can build up people's immunity to uh, misinformation arguments mm -hmm. so is that what you found in your research yeah so the the initial study i did was and as i was saying before I was focused on climate misinformation, um, but I ran an experiment where I explained a particular misinformation technique fake experts using people who convey the impression of being experts, but they don't have the actual relevant expertise, mm -hmm. um, but, they, but fake experts are quite persuasive. And I used tobacco misinformation as the example, like, like ads, newspaper ads going back to the mid 20th century, those kind of 1950s Mad Men style ads where it says, you know, uh, this doctor in a white coat says that mm -hmm. smoking soothes the throat, those kinds of ads, mm -hmm. uh, and explained how this was the fake expert strategy. And then I showed people after showing them this inoculation message, then I showed them climate misinformation that used the same technique and found that it was completely neutralized. And importantly, it was neutralized, like it had no influence on people across the political spectrum. Climate change is a very polarized topic. Um, but I found that whether people were Democrat or Republican, once they were had explained to them a technique used to deceive them, that technique no longer worked. And that really opened my eyes to this is a, this seems to be quite a powerful technique. Um, firstly, it depolarizes a very polarizing topic like climate change. And secondly, I can inoculate people against a technique with, in one topic and it will convey immunity in a completely different topic. So- Do you have research that eliminates that? Sorry, what was that? Do you have research that eliminates that or as it were proves that, that if you if you learn within one area that you automatically transfer knowledge to another area? 
Yeah, that's what my initial study found. My message, my inoculation message was about tobacco misinformation. Mm -hmm. But but then when I showed people climate misinformation, the climate misinformation was no longer uh, uh, misleading, even though I didn't mention that misinformation at all in my inoculating message. And mm -hmm. there's been, uh, in the inoculation research by other scientists, They've, they've found similar results. They call this the umbrella of protection. That you can inoculate people, and then it conveys this um, this umbrella of protection that spreads across topics. Uh, and so, in a way, this approach, this what we call technique based inoculation. Uh, I mean, it's really critical thinking. But but explaining the techniques, inoculating people by explaining misinformation techniques. It's kind of like a universal vaccine against misinformation. Well, um, <laughs> the research that you are bringing in, I can see that in certain ways, this could be uh, possible and effective. What, what this leaves out is uh, integration across all domains of human thought and one is uh, the when a person is motivated not to hear the information so if you're the ceo of a company and you are doing the same involved in the same research you may academically go along with it but when you get back to the office how do you actually behave so, um, all right, so this, this is um, what you're mainly focusing on then is what is done, the kinds of studies that are done in cognitive science. And it sounds like um, it's with all, it's, it's a problem with all academia, not reading the theory and critical thinking that's already been established because we don't tend to think across disciplines. We tend to think in narrow, uh, specialized ways. But if we go back to the concept in the problem of climate change and your interest in that specifically, what led you to these concerns? Um, when, yeah. I mean, as you, you think about your past and as you were growing up and you were moving through the educational process, when was it that you said, I really want to do something in this area? Um, what initiated that was, or what really drew me into the climate issue was getting into arguments with my father-in-law about climate change. <laughs> so <laughs> at that point, I was not uh, doing anything like I wasn't working in that area at all, um, tangentially interested in it. And at that point, I wasn't doing psychology research either. I wasn't even in academia. I was, I had done a physics degree. I had a physical science background, but at that time I was out of academia. But at a family get together, my um, father-in-law was presenting all these arguments on why climate change wasn't real. Mm -hmm. And I went away and looked looked into his arguments and found that they weren't based on science. And so uh, I confess that my initial interest in the topic was really just arming myself with knowledge for the next family get together mm -hmm. <laughs> and listing all the possible arguments that might come up and researching what did the science say about each argument. So mm -hmm. taking a very systematic approach, here are the, here are the key talking points that you would hear from a someone who is dismissive about climate change, but here is actually what the science says about them. At some point, I realized this resource that I was building for personal use was something that other people might find useful too. And so I, I took that information, reorganized it, and put it into a website, um, which uh, is this now the skepticalscience.com website. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that was real. That was when I first started, I guess, engaging with the public about communicating the facts of climate change and also debunking climate misinformation. And a couple of years into that process, 
uh, a psychology researcher approached me and basically sent me research pointing out all the things I was doing wrong, <laughs> like from a communication point of view, like here there are there are certain ways to effectively debunk misinformation and then there are ways to do it that are not so effective. And I was doing the ineffective ways uh, and that was quite a wake up moment that really drew me back into academia. I um, then started researching the psychology of misinformation and debunking and that gradually led to me doing a PhD with my PhD supervisor being that researcher who first emailed me. Hmm. Interesting. So then focusing on the, again, the, the problems that we face in terms of climate, how would you describe the health of the earth given your studies? Unhealthy. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about, there was a, a study published just recently arguing that we've actually tipped over the 1.5 degree warming threshold um, during the, I think it was 2015 in Paris uh, when they had the, the big climate summit um, at the end of 2015. They basically agreed that 1.5 was a threshold that we didn't want to get over um, mm -hmm. because, because then climate change became just that much more dangerous and difficult to deal with. And we are at, we are, the, the big scientific argument now is, have we crossed it or not? <laughs> you know, so, um, so we are, we are already well on the way to causing climate change. We're already suffering impacts. They will get worse in the future, but also we can still mitigate it and try to reduce the damage uh, as much as possible. That seems to be the message we keep hearing, but the problem is, are we moving, or the question is, are we moving fast enough? I understand that we look at not, we look at a number of factors to determine the health of the, eco, the ecosystems that we're focusing on here, including temperature rise, but also, and relevant to that, the percentage of the earth that is, as it were, green or not part of where humans are. And um, I believe that percentage, what we need is something like 65% uh, green. And we are, we don't have that right now. So is that something that you're aware of? Uh, no, I haven't really dug into those details in in any great detail. I've I've been I think becoming more and more tunnel vision on the psychology aspect and the communication aspect. At the beginning, when I was starting skeptical science, I, was, I very much had feet in both worlds: physical science and the social science. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, as I get more and more specialized on the social science question, yeah, I'm, I'm not as up to date on all the details of the physical science as much as I would like, but there's only so many hours in the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly. So what, what are the most important ideas that you've learned in your work that you think people should act upon in terms of climate change? What, what do you think that we can do other than obviously not believing in things that are not based in facts. And if we begin there. Yeah, so when I was based at George Mason University, um, my boss there, Ed Maybach, he, uh, who's the director of the Center for Climate Change Communication, he had a uh, really nice way of, well, his research really pointed to how people think about climate change and therefore how best to communicate it. Mm -hmm. And he said that really there's only five things that people need to know about climate change in order to have enough knowledge to um, act on it or be supportive of climate action. And you can summarize those five things in just 10 words. It's real, it's us it's bad, experts agree, there's hope. 
So um, we know that climate change is real and caused by humans, and the experts agree on this, and the impacts are going to be bad, but we do have all the solutions and technology to solve it. Uh, and so our, while climate change is very complicated and the science is rich and nuanced, the the, I, the basic concept there that we're causing this, but we're also able to solve it is is the key message that we need to communicate to people. <laughs> but if I only had like, mm -hmm. sorry, one more last thing. If I only had to button, narrow that down to one thing, I would communicate the experts agree that over 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming. Mm -hmm. You do bring up in one of your works the problem of cherry picking and in connection with what you just said. So if 90% agree, then more than the vast majority agree, almost everyone statistically agrees. But if someone is trying to, as it were, prove the other side, they are going to cherry pick within the 3%. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and when we look at the techniques of misinformation, that is one of them. Uh, we call it magnified minority. Taking that three, or really it's more like one to 2% of experts who are still contrarian, they still disagree with human caused global warming and magnifying their influence and profile so that they so that there appears to still be a scientific debate. And that's why when the media portray climate change as a debate between a contrarian and a climate scientist, the public just come away with it, this um, impression of a 50-50 debate, thinking that there's 50% agreement when there's actually like nearly 100% agreement. Mm -hmm. And that's quite misleading. Uh, a lot, that, that's an important point. The Along these lines, another another problem that I see is some people will say, or let's just say I had a conversation with someone recently who said to me, um, I don't see any problems. I don't, I'm not, everything's fine. The, the weather's the same as it was. The the seasons changed the same the way that they did. I, I don't see it. And I, um, and somebody said that to me in two different major climates. And I'm looking out at the ocean and I don't see any changes and I don't see any cliffs falling. And, and <laughs> um, the, what, what I have said to them is I, I'm not, I don't base this decision on what I see or what I experience. I base it on what the experts tell me is happening. Because since I'm not one, since I'm not a scientist, I'm not in a position to figure it out on my own. All I can figure out is what I directly perceive. And I know that that can be misleading. So I know that it's not good for me to rely upon myself in this regard, but to go to the experts. Now, as you say, we can't just find the so-called expert because we may accidentally stumble across one that's in the one or 2% that's in this case denying. And so we have to be able to not only find the experts, but we have to be able to look at their work and to make sense of their work to some degree as thinkers. And by the way, if someone is a quote expert, but they're actually not an expert, then we shouldn't call them an expert. <laughs> they may call themselves that. So they're, the people that are deniers of scientific reality, I don't see how you can then actually call yourself a scientist. But that this is, I guess, a matter of debate. You, we could call you a bad scientist in this regard if you're, if you're systematically not facing the data. Yeah, I mean, well, firstly, yeah, that that I that those arguments you hear where they say, well, I haven't, you know, I look at the ocean, it looks fine, or a cliff hasn't fallen on me, so what's the issue? Um, that's one of the big psychological challenges about climate change. Um, 
which we call psychological distance. When you have a problem that seems psychologically distant, then people are less likely to be concerned about it. Mm -hmm. And climate change is psychologically distant in a number of different ways. Um, firstly, it's a problem that's happening over decades and our brains are hardwired to deal with a predator jumping out of the bushes at us right now. Uh, you know, we deal with the short term. Uh, it's also a problem that's spread out over the whole globe and we're, our brains are hardwired for localised immediate problems in our immediate environment. Uh, and, and there's other aspects that make it seem distant uh, and therefore difficult to uh, communicate the, the urgency to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's even without misinformation. Even if we lived in this ideal world where misinformation right. didn't exist, we would have these just basic challenges of how our brains are hardwired um, and climate change being this not a local immediate problem that our, our human brains evolved to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's why like it's a very simple message, like 97% of climate experts agree, kind of cuts through that because when we deal with complicated scientific issues, um, a heuristic or a mental shortcut that people take is they defer to the opinions of experts and, and just communicating the overall expert opinion is is a um, elegant, efficient way to, to communicate that. Well, and then what role does wishful thinking play in this? So, yeah, right. Yeah, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to elaborate. So in this particular problem, I, I, I mean, this particular example that I was giving, you're talking to the woman and she says this, and, and she's actually, part of it is that she would really like to believe that nothing is changing. And I, I all of us fall into that to some degree in different areas of our life. And I know that I myself would very much like to engage in wishful thinking regarding the health of the earth. So you can see it, in, you can see it in yourself. Anyway, go on, please. Oh yeah, and we're all subject to wishful thinking, especially when we're motivated to reason in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, my um, probably, my weakness with wishful thinking is when does food in the fridge no longer uh, be, be healthy to eat? <laughs> I, would go, I would go way past the expiry date and continue to eat it. And I think that's wishful thinking or motivated reasoning. Um, so, so, so we, you know, we all are subject to that and psychological denial can happen with climate change for a variety of reasons. One reason is because it's this big, scary problem that we just don't want to have to deal with, deal with the stress of it. Um, and so we, that motivates us to deny that it's a problem. Another reason or, or motive is that we're the cause so every time we flick a light switch or start our car or get on a plane, there's this nagging thought that we're contributing to this problem and, mm -hmm. and that makes us feel bad about ourselves. So that adds another motive to deny. Uh, and then the biggest driver of climate denial is political ideology. The solutions to climate change typically or often involve regulating the fossil fuel industry and people whose ideology is involves deregulation, small government, uh, not liking in like wanting industries to be free, having free markets, uh, they don't like those solutions to climate change. But uh, rather than come up with market friendly solutions, unfortunately, they tend to instead deny that there's a problem in the first place that needs solving. Yes, it seems that. In terms of the green economy, as far as I can tell, it's stalling in a lot of areas. And by that, I mean, there are many, many, many things that you cannot get into your home that are eco-friendly. You're looking for an earth-friendly this or that, whatever it may be. It's, it's very difficult to find the everyday products that we need in many areas, not all areas. And um, we are continuing to, for example, cut down trees, even 
old growth trees to publish books, which is to me, it, we're, we're, we should be well beyond that stage. So there are so many things. And I, I think this is connected to the act part of the action part of the five, I think act was the last of the five terms that, so the, on the action part, it seems that you would say, I think just go, go, go and act, <laughs> go, go and do something that will contribute to sustainability. So now that you accept that this is happening, that this is real, then go and do something <laughs> to help. Is that right? Um, yes. Uh, but, and that actually, uh, I've had a thought before and then I lost it, but it, it, you've just reminded me. Um, another reason why people can be in denial of a problem is because they lack efficacy or they feel powerless to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So so empowering people, giving them that sense of efficacy is, is important as well. Uh, and... And there are lots of ways that people can act to help contribute to solving climate change. Um, and it was interesting, like when back in 2015, I was interviewing a lot of um, experts, climate scientists, or people working in climate solutions, asking them about their work. But I asked all of them the same question, which was when people ask you, what can I do about climate change? what do you say like what is the action that you recommend to people mm -hmm. and it was interesting because i got lots of different answers but all the different actions that they suggested fell into two buckets one was actions you can do to reduce your own carbon footprint you know like get solar panels drive less fly less um, change your light bulbs you know, these kind of things, like doing things that reduce your own individual footprint. But the other thing they talked about, and which I realized was more important, was collective actions, doing things that help build the social and political momentum. Um, and, and really the most basic thing that anyone can do ultimately is just open their mouth and talk about climate change to their friends, their families, to anyone because talking about climate change contributes to, well, firstly, it sends that social signal that you mm -hmm. care about it, but then it, it helps contribute to the social momentum towards collective action. And ultimately, to solve climate change, we need to transition from fossil fuels to renewables. Uh, we need to become a, a zero carbon society. And that re requires not changing our light bulbs or Mm -hmm. or um, you know, doing those small actions. It requires a societal change and we need social and political momentum to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So this is much harder than what we can do individually. So I think there's the, there is the psychological dimension, the sense of uh, self-efficacy or efficacy, as you said, let's just call it the sense that I am a potent individual, that I'm capable of doing something of significance. And I think that that's one thing I want to, again, just stress to people, that there's so much that you can do. And just because you may not be able to take collective action immediately or you can't quite figure out a way you can work on that you can develop that continue to think about that what can i really do over there and you can also do many things individually that will will help with the psychological sense that i'm doing something and as a small example of this there's an area at the end of my road where there were just a lot of weeds, mainly, I mean, human induced, just big tall grasses. And so last year I just pulled them all out. It's, 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 it's common land. It's just a short, you know, it's a small circle at the end of the cul-de-sac. And now I'm watching the native grasses come up there where before it was just nothing for the birds, nothing 
and, and it's amazing. It's one uh, one um, botanist on one TV program I was watching said, if you give nature an inch, then it will take a mile. And mm -hmm. it's an example of that. So that that is that makes me personally feel good because I can see a bird going down and I can see that bird eating. Yes, we we are going to have to have this on a broad scale, but um, so we need to do both, I think, one for the psychological and for the immediate area. But if all of us worked in our immediate areas, we would also be connecting collected collectively. Right. So there are lots of things that we can do in our communities as well. Yeah. And, and I, that, that would probably be the second thing I would recommend is connect to your local communities um, mm -hmm. and find out what other people are doing. And you'll just learn what options and, and what, what things are available to you. Uh, and the last thing I would say is uh, we are, everyone is unique. Their situation is unique and, and each person has their own interests and skills. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's really powerful. Uh, particularly we, you combine all the things that that are unique to you and they they combine in something that is even more unique um think of ways that you can bring that to use uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's what i've tried to do with my work trying to draw upon my background and the, the unique combination of the different things that i've done and uh and they they add up to something that um is is quite unique and engaging and hopefully will help make a difference mm -hmm. And so back to your other point, though, about fossil fuels, you've made it clear. We have to, we've got to get to this point where we are no longer reliant upon these fuels and yesterday rather than tomorrow. It's, we're too late. We've got to stop it now. And then it behooves all of us to ask, how then am I contributing to that problem? And what can I do to help with this? And this includes looking, I think, for um, places in the green economy where you can, if you're interested as an entrepreneur, if you're watching this, listening to this, you can say, well, I could start a business here and that would help, you know, offset. I can start this green business that will reduce the amount of poly. I can start a, a company that makes vests, organic cotton vests for uh, dogs, and that will do away with the polyester we're using for the material. I mean, there are just so many, many things and so many opportunities for entrepreneurs to help contribute in this way wouldn't you say oh definitely and and the market will only um strengthen for that over time um you know over the deck over the last few decades the as the science of climate change has got stronger as the climate impacts have become more severe and we are seeing them become more severe so while anecdotally people might not think that weather is changing scientifically looking at the big picture, we do see that weather is becoming more extreme and mm -hmm. um, and therefore culturally and societally, there is a growing um, acceptance of climate change and acceptance for climate solutions. And that's only going to get stronger over time. And so I'm not an entrepreneur, I'm an academic, but but if if you're someone who's like, you know, got their finger in the air listening for what, where is society headed, there's just going to be more and more opportunities to, um, mm. to I, well, find solutions uh, and and then um, solutions that help make a difference. But also, you know, fill a need um, can can be a good business opportunity as well. The, uh, there's another thing that my um, previous boss Ed Maybach used to say. He said that if you want to achieve behavior change, you need to make it. What were the three things? Um, fun, easy, and impactful. Mm -hmm. So think of that from an entrepreneurial point of view. If you can come up with some solution, product, service that is fun and easy, but it makes a difference, mm -hmm. then um, not only will it make a difference to help solve climate change, but 
you know, that could be also a great business opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so um, then I want to just talk a little bit more about what you've seen in terms of changes over time. You've already basically been talking about this. It's one of my questions. So I just want to build on this. So you've been working in this area of climate change or thinking about this, uh, pro these problems for a number of years. And what, what do you think has changed in addition to anything you've already just said? in terms of the political aspect or the scientific aspect or any other aspect? Um, yeah, lots of shifts. Uh, firstly, on the misinformation front, what we're seeing is that climate misinformation is shifting from science-based arguments to solutions-based arguments. In other words, they're no longer or they're less arguing climate change isn't real and they're more arguing that climate solution won't work or it'll harm the economy or mm. basically casting doubt on solutions in order to delay climate action. Um, all climate misinformation has the same goal, delay climate action, but they're making a strategic retreat away from science mm. denial. Um, nevertheless, public opinion about climate change has has just gradually been shifting as well. Um, the the Yale University and George Mason University collect these national representative surveys in the US twice a year and they're seeing this very definite trend that the public are getting more accepting of the reality of climate change that humans are causing it the need to act and supporting climate solutions mm -hmm. so the public is shifting towards that as well the the biggest negative trend i would say is it's be, climate change has become more polarized and it's get gotten to the point the polarization is so pronounced that now it's becoming a proxy for other broader culture wars. Mm -hmm. So you have general polarized culture wars, this kind of two sides that are very suspicious and distrustful of each other. And climate change has kind of got pulled into that. So some of the misinformation that you see now is, is more tribal. It's, so it's not about solutions. It's not about science. It's about tribalism. It's making arguments like, that other group, those climate activists or those lefty woke warriors mm -hmm. who are different to us, they want to interfere with our freedom, they want to interfere with our lifestyles, take away our burgers, take away our gas stoves, take away our lifestyle. So it's it's very much this othering uh, and um, mm -hmm. just making these sort of tribal arguments, which mm -hmm. can be quite powerful because ultimately humans are social animals. So social arguments are quite persuasive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the sociocentrism is is playing a major role there. Group think the when this is powerful, then the data will be viewed in any way potentially the group wants it to be viewed. So it's a common problem as we know throughout human life and has been it's um it's it's hard to break through to to these groups because they have so locked in their beliefs and the logic of their beliefs are so established and they're rewarding and um encouraging one another in these beliefs and it's true because we believe it is the, or it's true because we want to believe it are the primary standards they're using. So this, what we have to hope is that the groups are small enough not to keep everyone else from full steam ahead. And that's, I think, what those of us who are, are we, we understand that it's real, we understand that it's us. We understand that it's bad, and we get what that we have to add, that we have to look to the actual experts for the for to understand the problems and to a large extent to uh, to figure out the solutions. But many of the solutions are right here, right before our very faces. They're just right there, and some not so much. Now, one question I wanted to ask you is having to do with the concept of nuclear power 
And let me just say that I listened to a lecture about a year ago or so by a professor from uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara. And she is in is focused on environmental issues. And she said, there are lots of things we can do. And she was very encouraging for all of us to plant trees in our backyard and so forth. But she said, because of how far behind we are in, in moving away from fossil fuels and facing these problems, the only real solution, she said, is nuclear power. And because it's clean and et cetera. And, but she also said, but the technology is not really there to do it in a widespread way in the way that we need to. And of course we know that there are concerns with nuclear power and physically as well as politically. Would you, do you have any comment on that? Yeah. Um, and again, this is a little bit outside my lane, but, but my perceptions and I'll qualify it as a non-expert on the issue of nuclear. Um, so I'm not portraying myself as an expert, mm -hmm. but my impression of this, of this question is that it's really a matter of, well, what is the most practical way to make that transition transition quickly, given that point that the technology is not necessarily there to scale up at speed because we need to do it quickly. Um, whereas renewables, uh, the technology is there to scale up at speed. So, so it's really just a question of which technologies can can get us through that transition uh, quickly enough, uh, and also affordably, because renewables have been coming down in price steadily over time, and in many contexts, it's actually cheaper than fossil fuels. Um, so, uh, and if it's not, then it's it's headed in that direction. So, um, so, but it's a complicated question too. It really, and it's. Well, just to clarify, if I could, for a minute, when you say renewables, you mean specifically what? Yeah, so I I would be talking about wind, solar, hydro. Um, right. mm -hmm. Not, I, I guess I don't put nuclear in that in that bucket. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But it, but it, it's it's a more nuanced. Thing, and it often depends on the context and the society and what their situation is. Is there, you know, is it British Columbia where it already has lots of hydro? Is it, is it another place like Australia where we have a lot of sun, we have a lot of coastlines, uh, and right. the capacity for wind and solar? Right. Um, so it it really there's no one size fits all, and that's where the solutions arguments are just a lot more complex than something like the greenhouse effect, which is the laws of physics that are the same everywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's, yeah, it's a harder. So, harder so, in other, so in other words, the solutions are a bit more complicated than the, the science that proves that there's the problem and that humans are playing a, a large role in the problem. Yes, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and this is my challenge as an academic whose research has found that the future of climate misinformation will be about solutions. But I've been playing at the science end of the pool, <laughs> you know, the shallow end of the pool essentially for most of my career. And I, I'm now having to get outside my comfort zone and and find delve into these more complex nuance issues. And yeah, that's, that's a bit uncomfortable for me. So in other words, for most of your career, you've been focusing on the problem that people are not, that they don't, they, they don't believe in the, that it's real, that it's us and that it's bad and that we need to listen to the experts. And now yeah. the things are shifting enough that we now need to focus more on the solutions, which is actually a good problem. And now you'll you'll be focusing in that area. Yeah, yeah, reluctantly getting pulled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we we all are. And the back in the 1980s, there were a number of writers who were saying things are becoming more complicated. They're they're rapidly increasing, 
and we're going to have to really do a lot of changes in our thinking over a lifetime. And we've seen that. So we're always having to reinvent ourselves. We're always having to, to, and, and when I say this, I mean, if you, if you're, if, if you have, if you're in any career, you, you look at what's happened just in the last two or three years and some things may be very different. Whereas in the past, you, you might've gone 20 or 30 years and basically you're plodding along and things were, or it seemed uh, basically the same. So we're always having to, to catch up with <laughs> and try to stay ahead of the realities that we're facing as humans and we're not prepared for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and just to make it even more difficult, the climate change is a very interconnected problem. It, it involves um, psychology and um, uh, like culture, politi politics, um, and technology, and not only the technology of like fossil fuels and renewables, but also the technology of social media and information systems and how information disseminates and misinformation disseminates and how people consume information. Uh, and because the problem is of like climate misinformation is so interconnected in that way, it means that the solutions need to be interconnected and holistic as well. In other words, mm -hmm. if you're trying to develop solutions to misinformation, you, you essentially need interdisciplinary solutions working with people working in in different areas and and that's the other thing that's dragged me into out of my comfort zone of like you know, you know I'm a psychology researcher researcher I do my little lab experiments and I publish my papers and it's you know our lab experiments are designed to be very clean and sterile you're trying to minimize all the confounds as possible to make make it um make your results as uh, clear as possible but then when you're trying to develop, design real world interventions, you need to be working with um, people in other disciplines. I've had to work with critical thinking philosophers, um, computer scientists who can develop machine learning models to help detect misinformation, app developers and graphic designers who can help design uh, interventions that, that are engaging and interactive and scalable. Uh, and and that's hard as well, is is because people in different disciplines um, work in different ways, use different vocabulary and terminology. Hence my jargony talk at the beginning of our conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you have to kind of try to get everyone um, thinking, uh, you know, at least talking on the same page. Uh, mm -hmm. It's challenging, but when you can make it happen, you can come up with really powerful solutions. Mm -hmm. And it's true in our work. We have often stressed the the problems, the problem of over specialization and compartmentalization in academia. It's mm. been a major flaw in the way that we think about education. We we don't think of ourselves as an integrated whole. We don't think in terms of general uh, skills of mind that we want all students to have and all people to have in order to advance fair-minded critical societies. Uh, we don't, uh, we're in, people tend to be down in some one of their um, areas of interest and that won't do. And in our work, we invite everyone to the table of critical thinking. Every, every field can contribute and in every field, there are the highest level thinkers and there are the lowest level thinkers. And there is everyone in between. And so we, when we stress the importance of integration of ideas, and that's what we're talking about here, to be able to start, let's say, an, an, a, a new small business, let's say, as you see, as you've mentioned, you have to be multi-skilled or you have to bring multiple skilled people who are multiply skilled to the table and they have to be able to work together and we need to use ordinary languages because those are the ones that are available to all of us and this is why we want to unpack the in any of these 
complex concepts that we are mentioning. For example, when you said renewables, now you might have thought, why is she even asking me that question? It's obvious, isn't it? I mean, it's wind, mm -hmm. it's solar, it's, and, and it, yes, it's obvious, but maybe not. Maybe when, when someone is listening to this, they hear renewable, they immediately think solar, but what else? Oh yeah, it's wind and it's um, the hydro and there may be others, you see. So it, it, all of us, fall prey to this this truncating our our words and we do that because it's handy but we want to unpack at times and need to well there is a tremendous amount in your books that we were not able to get to but um is there anything that you would like to add then before we bring this to a close, because you won't have time to further uh, really explore the ideas in the books. You have many, many concepts that would uh, are helpful for people if they're trying to understand the climate crisis. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll add one last thing. Um, and this is really kind of just fleshing out something I mentioned earlier. That I talked about how, as individuals, we can bring all our um, unique, you know, skills and background and um, experiences to the table. Uh, what, before I was a, um, after I was a physicist, but before I was a cognitive psychologist, I was a cartoonist. So I did cartooning in between my two different academic <laughs> careers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at some point during my psychology research, really just after my, I finished my PhD, I started to explore using humor to um, engage the public about climate change and and but as a scientist tested it maybe maybe I'm the only cartoonist who knows the p-values on how funny his comics are but um mm -hmm. uh, and but what I found was it's it's a really effective approach and then I started combining the critical thinking research with the psychology research with the cartoons um in and testing those and, and finding promise there. And then I met some app developers and then we started putting all that stuff into game form. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I'll just reiterate before, think think of what um, what is unique, what, uh, do, can the different things combine in interesting, engaging ways and be very open to the possibility of, of creativity uh, and humor because it's it's very engaging and we need to engage not just people's minds with data and science but also their hearts and the arts is is a key to doing that excellent the the concept of creativity is directly connected with the concept of critical thinking because cr without credit without creativity critical thinking is merely um focusing on what is wrong in the thinking it's we need to do that we need to find problems in our thinking where there are problems but we also need in that process to create solutions and again we all have to have belief in our own individual capacities and i want to piggyback on what you said and you, you came back to it by saying again, well, look, this is what I did. And I did some of this and I did some of that. And you can see I have this kind of interest. And I I, I really put my mind over here and, and it, it came up with something and I combined it with this. And and so for all, all of us can do something similar on our own individual paths, given what we have the capacity to achieve and are interested in, and you're bringing in the arts, this is very, a very good move. And I was, I was going to just give an example of this. I, I know that there is a, a company in California that's working on a solar powered automobile that is, um, will be, the, the 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 doors are panels are solar panels and then you should and they're small they're they're very small the early ones and so this is an example of someone who had the the ability to to 
fly an, an airplane and he used some knowledge that he had there to create, you see, this model. And hopefully this will come to fruition. But if it doesn't, someone will figure this out. Someone will be making auto, uh, automobiles in the future that are solar paneled. And it's it, the sky really is the limit. We all can mm. do something. I invite everyone to push that envelope, but in a realistic way. In other words, you want to do something that is realistic for yourself, but is something where you feel your own power. So thank you for sharing that story. Yeah, my pleasure. It was great to talk to you. Yes, and thank you for coming onto the program. There is so much more to discuss in this uh, on this on this set of issues. Thank you for taking the time to join us from Australia, and thank you for the good work that you're doing to contribute to the solutions. Yeah, so. um, uh, and likewise, um, your work, what uh, what you're doing with critical thinking is so important and. Uh, and keep up the good fight. Thank you. And thank you again for coming. And thank you for to all of you who have joined us. We hope that this has been inspiring and that you let us know what you're doing to realize your potential and feel that you are contributing to the solutions. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.